Hello, this is Angela with the Connections Tuesday live webinar. Ray and Jean will be on any minute now. Thank you for joining us, all of you. We're gonna go live on Facebook in just one second. But for now, get into a comfortable position. Make sure you have something nice to drink. Maybe make sure the lights are a little dim, right? Make sure that you're free of any distractions around you, meaning a light on in another room, your phone buzzing, you know, giving you notifications. Try your best to reduce those distractions for now. Because during this session, Dr. Ray and Jean will be talking about something in detail and, you know, really want your mind to be open and for you to be focused because it can be a little bit of a difficult topic to, you know, understand. So if you want to participate, if you have questions, go ahead and use the chat or the Q&A feature and we'll make sure to answer them. Hello, Dr. Angie. Hello, Angie. Hey, How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Oh, I was cool. just urging everyone listening to us to try their best to reduce any of the distractions around them, like lights on in other rooms and the notifications on their phone, yes. you know, things like that. Because topic. I, yeah, I haven't even mentioned it yet. I will leave that for you two to discuss. Okay, yeah. that's cool. Um, we are, uh, we're having a, a new cocktail tonight, Ange. We're having uh, our martinis here. <laughs> okay. Uh, we went to uh, Lakeside Inn this past weekend, you know, to check out the the inn where we were are going to have our couples weekend intensive, and uh, getting all the, you know, details in place and everything. And there's like several wineries up there and this the, the distillery that we went up there and. Um, brought back some. Um, so these are from some Jer spirits. Journeyman. Yeah, Journeyman. I have distillery. the vodka, and Ray has the gin martini. Nice. Yeah. So it was a really nice, relaxing trip. Going up to this inn is always a, a wonderful time because it's just so relaxing. You um, can see some of our drone footage where we're on the porch with the swings. Yeah. And sitting by the pond. So this hundred foot porch with like fifty rocking chairs on it, and it's just the two awesome. of us on there. And I did some drone footage out into the lake. You know, I was thinking about in 2006, I believe, we made our first video. And our first video was called A Glass of Wine with Dr. Ray and Jean. You weren't a doctor yet. No, I Just wasn't. Ray and Jean. Yeah. And um, that actually is still on, it's on YouTube. Yeah, on, I on think it's on our, our Lighthouse. And your, your hair was very different. <laughs> Yeah. Both of your hairs Both of our are hair. very different. Right. Yeah. Very different. Yeah. No, we've been doing this a long time. Uh, a lot less time. now. Right. So, you know, the topic we're going to talk about today is one we absolutely never wanted to get into. And so we, when we decided we wanted to work with couples, we really thought we were going to be talking about, you know, communication issues and how to fight differently and how to connect. Yeah, and, affection and... Mm -hmm you know, just kind of spending more time with each yeah. other. But uh, really the topic today is something that's very, just kind of- Much more personal. Much more personal. And that's, you know, the topic of sexual health. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, couples would bring that to us. And back in the day we were like, oh, are we really gonna go there? Are we qualified to go there? Do we know enough about it? And, you know, what we found over the years is, well, as a couple, we have our own, sexual journey and there's also a, not a lot out there in resources and and what we're talking about is not a pathological you know someone has a porn addiction or sex addiction we're talking about sexual health and the development of a bonded pair relationship over a long period of time yeah which a lot of couples never get to that point because mm -hmm. you know they they're not able to grow. They're not able to heal a lot of those wounds. And then what happens is that they end up divorcing uh, and then they start it all over again, right? They start that journey all over again with someone new. And, and so, you know, when it comes to sexual health and sexual development, it is something that takes time, right? And so this topic, sexual health within a bonded couple, a committed couple, 
is a journey, as Gene mentioned. It's something that takes probably the length of the entire relationship. You know, I would say, you know, talking about a journey, I know we talk about this probably ad nauseum to some people about our hiking. But when we started the John Muir Trail, we live in Chicago and Chicago's a very flat place. And we started the trail in this really amazing place that had eight miles of completely flat ground, which we now know was the only eight miles of flat ground on the entire 200 mile trail. Right. And when we got to our first mountain pass, we started going up. We didn't even get a half a mile up. And I was like, I'm done. <laughs> we had stopped for the night. <laughs> I mean, we'd already been hiking like almost 10 miles, but it was like, what is this? Like, that was not something we, right. Yeah, I mean, we did the Appalachian trail, which is about half the size. And, and so I, I think our sexual journey is the same way. You know, when you're, when you're young and you're um, first becoming a sexual being, it's about yourself. It's your own body. It's your own uh, learning about the world and those experiences. It's your own, you, even if you have a partner, there, there's not enough of a bond to say it's our sex life. It's still just my sex life, you know? And in the beginning, it's just very, very, very physical. There's a lot of hormones. There's a lot of um, new newness. Yeah. Yeah. Not nudeness, which it also has, but new, right, right. newness that is not so much about bonding or connecting. No, I, I mean, physically in the brain, mm -hmm. we have, you know, oxytocin, which is a bonding a chemical, right. Uh, when we do have, um, intercourse and have orgasm, but there's also the endorphins that are just running through our entire system in the beginning of a relationship. It's so exciting you know, and there's very little risk in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, it's, you know, you, you can let go a lot more and there isn't, there aren't too many hangs, hang ups, hang ups at that point in the journey of the relationship, you know, and as the couple starts to develop their relationship and start becoming more of a bonded couple, those endorphins, they go away, they start to dissipate. And then what happens is the real journey starts. So just kind of what Gene was talking about, you know, with that hiking uh, journey that we did in 2016. I mean, what we're at zero, zero feet of elevation, like right here, something like that here in Chicago. And so we start at 8,000 feet of elevation, just off the bat, just a, a getting accustomed to that is something that, you know, is very difficult, but then to go up to 11,000 feet, 12,000 feet of elevation, it is a very difficult journey. Right. And when we first started and we're just kind of hopping and skipping along on this, on this hike, we thought, wow, if this is Lovely. the way it's gonna be, <laughs> this is great. But then as you start that journey up into the mountains, that's when you really start to understand the gravity, right? And, and the depth of this journey and how hard it is really going to be. If you know what a marmot is, if you've seen a marmot, you know what we're talking about because marmots live at 10,000 feet or higher. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, in the beginning, um, people used to wait, people used to date. Mm. They used to make a commitment to each other before they had sex. They would become an official couple in the world as their uh, sex life was developing. And they, had some really great experiences because they would do all the, the really good stuff, the stuff that kind of goes away later, like kissing for hours and the heavy petting kind of stuff. And, and they had this resistance to uh, not going so quickly, so fast. And if you listen to our podcast, in, in the beginning, we used to ask people the question, you know, how soon into your relationship did you have sex? Right. And we had to erase every single one of them because they all came back and said, I don't want my I, mom to yeah, hear this. I don't want my parents to find out, right? Because usually it was very quick. Yeah. So couples are having right. sex younger and they're having sex much sooner in a relationship. And so all the stuff that bonds from an emotional place um, and from a, a level of safety and security of having a uh, committed relationship first 
doesn't exist. And so there's a lot more insecurity. There's a lot more uh, vulnerability. I always thought it was interesting um, that you had to have a conversation. People did not want to have a conversation with a person they would have sex with about condoms. Mm. Like this is, you know, in the eighties and early nineties when yeah. AIDS was really a big thing. And that was like a health concern. And it was like, oh, that's too intimate to talk about yeah. condoms, but it's not too intimate to actually have sex. <laughs> right. And, and when we say that couples are having sex initially in the relationship, it's based on what they think sex is supposed to be, mm -hmm. um, what society teaches them it's supposed to be, what the media teaches them what it's supposed to be. And it is also attached to a lot of expectations, right? And so a lot of times people are let down, right? Or they have, you know, these insecurities that are going on in their head that they're not sharing with their partner. Mm -hmm. They're keeping it to themselves. Because the emotional safety isn't there yet. Right. So they don't, they don't know how to have a difficult conversation before there's like a really intimate thing that comes up. Mm -hmm. right? And so what happens is that as that relationship starts to develop, now they start getting into the real work, right? Mm -hmm. And so what comes up for healing in every single couple is all of their past insecurities about sex, all of their past like like uh, wrong messages, mm -hmm. right? That they learned their hurts, Rejection. rejections, mm -hmm. um, you know, abandonments in past relationships, all of that, just, just ball of all of that negativity starts to come to the surface in the relationship and it plays out in the bedroom. Right, because that ball of uh, negative emotions is going to be uh, shrink wrapped in an emotion called shame. Mm -hmm. because yeah. shame says you don't belong <clears throat> you're not good enough and so every time we're rejected when we have you know feelings for another person and infatuation and we're rejected by that we feel shame mm -hmm. and so uh then what happens is you know there's all sorts of we get ghosted we don't know what happened someone breaks up with us there's no good closure we don't know why things are happening and we can't help but wonder what what's wrong with me what did I do? Or I'm not good enough. Or, you know, she's hotter than me or he's more money, whatever, whatever those right. things are, we, we're, we're guessing at it in our heads because we're not having any real conversations about it. And this is long before marriage. Right. And so we're storing all of that, you know, it's and just, been stored. yeah, sorry, Ange, go ahead. I'm just wondering, Jean, when you just said we're not having real conversations about it in the situations that you're describing, like ghosting you know getting ghosted or getting rejected after whatever number of date do you mean a conversation with ourselves or with the you know people we've been in a relationship with with people we've been in a relationship where they would say you know what this isn't working for me you are overbearing or you are uh too quiet or you're whatever it is whatever they're thinking they don't tell you yeah. And they say, it's not you, it's me. If they yeah. say anything <laughs> or ghosted, they don't tell you anything. So you, right. you don't even have an opportunity to say, well, that just wasn't a good fit. This person wanted a lot more of uh, social interactions or hang out with their families. And, you know, I'm a couch potato or whatever those reasons that we don't yeah. even know. That would be ideal mm -hmm. if our past relationship would share that information right. with us when we're breaking up, because then we would be able to learn mm -hmm. and then we'd be able to take that to the next relationship and maybe do things better. But what happens ultimately, unfortunately, is that we start to internalize that and we, we internalize that rejection and we make it about us. So mm -hmm. I was not hot enough or I was not good enough or whatever that is. And, and now that insecurity, it, we add it to the debt pile and we carry that into the next relationship. Now, once we get married, we commit ourselves to our, our life partner. Oh, see now, now <laughs> classroom is in session, right? I, I would even go back just one step right before that. And even in the early stages of marriage, when we talk about a conflict of needs, so we have our physical needs for sure, but we also have emotional needs. So our partner might be meeting some of our needs, but maybe not all of them. And when, when we don't feel those needs being met, 
and we're young, we think I got to find someone else to meet those needs. So there's a lot of cheating that happens early on in relationships because people don't have that, that maturity to have those conversations or to work through those issues. So they just go, well, you're not giving me enough attention. This person over here is giving me attention. I'm going to go over there, but I don't want to break up with you because you're also doing these things for me and my family loves you and it's working over here, but not over there. And Mm -hmm. I don't know how to merge that. And so they don't end those relationships and say, Hey, we're different. It's not working. They, they trade us in Mm -hmm. or have something on the side. That's really painful. And unfortunately this also Mm -hmm. happens in marriage too, right? That if there is any type of affair or cheating happening, it is happening early on Mm -hmm. as a lot of these insecurities that we're talking about start to come to the surface and starts to play out in the bedroom. And so now we'll, we'll start to see couples who, you know, are not being intimate as much, you know, anymore, or they're not even sleeping in the same bed, or, you know, it, it's coincides with having their first child, right? Because now a lot of their attention and energy is going to go to the children. And so it leaves room for a lot of these distractions to come in into that gap that's mm-hmm. being created, right? And so now it seems like, oh, this other person's giving me more attention. That seems, that seems so much more exciting. It seems like it used to be right in the beginning of the Yeah. Especially if you're not balancing a checkbook with that person, Yeah, you don't, <laughs> you don't have to deal with any of the issues. You just get to have all the fun. If you think about younger in your life, in, in your twenties, you don't have much money. You're working for very little and you know, you have to cut corners and you have to survive and you have to try to make more money and you work at it. But when we're in a relationship, we don't think like that. We don't think, well, maybe I should invest more in this relationship and we should learn to work through these things and then we'll have something. We go, oh, this isn't meeting my needs. I need to go figure it out somewhere else. Right. It's like having parents that would just hand you money every time you got in trouble. You know, if you racked up some credit card debt, like, oh, we'll just pay that off. And that's just not realistic. And it doesn't help us find the discipline to mature to the life skills that we really need when we become parents. Mm, yeah. Yes. So, because, yeah. Real quick, but finish what you were saying. No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, you just got me thinking because you mentioned the in the twenties, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I was meeting with a client recently and she was talking about a relationship in her past when she is early twenties and how, if it was up to her, she wouldn't have left that relationship and reflecting on it now as an older person, she was like, oh, that's because I was naive and in my early twenties. So, and I, you know, I can relate to that. I think Everybody probably can. Mm -hmm. We can look back on relationships when we were younger and think, what was I thinking? You know, Um, what is going on in the brain, Dr. Ray and Jean, when we're, let's say, 20 something? You know, first of all, I'd like to distinguish between someone who is what you would call a player or a serial cheater, someone who uses other people. Yeah, that's we're not talking about that. We're not talking about that Mm -hmm. at all. That's something that's a different conversation here. Um, and that's someone that's manipulative and, you know, antisocial and narcissistic. I mean, that's separate. But what we're talking about here is a normal developmental mm-hmm. process here. And when you're in your 20s, you're not really thinking about this, you know, 30 years from now. You're, you're thinking about the here and now. You're thinking about creating your career and, you know, getting your bank account set and just really trying to, uh, you know, kind of fly in this world, right? And so when it comes to relationships, you're, you're really just kind of bumbling through a lot of things. Yeah, if, um, if you would try to think about finding a partner who would be a good parent to your children, you would have a way different dating experience than trying to find someone who turns you on. And so what we're talking about is normal, healthy people that are capable of bonding, but they just don't have that, like Angie said, that naivete of, but, you know, I've watched, Disney princesses my whole life and they have this cute little banter and then they fall in love but then they live happily ever after yeah. and why doesn't it feel that way why is the happily ever after seem like a lot of work because nobody talks about the work nobody right. talks about the steps 
that's necessary to go from love and excitement and passion to happily ever after. Mm -hmm. And that process here is what we're talking about is this developmental process that couples go through, through stages of their relationship, not just, and we've talked about this in the past, about this, this emotional developmental stages that, that couples go through, but their sex life follows that same kind of pattern as well. Mm -hmm. And they can get stuck in many of these different areas and not develop and, and get, you know, stuck in this rut and not connect, right? Which is the ultimate form of connection with another human being, right? Is this, this spiritual, physical, emotional, mental connection that we can have with a committed partner. And to answer your question, Andrew, to talk about what's going on in the brain in the 20s, uh, the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed yet, right? And the prefrontal cortex is right here behind our forehead. That is in charge of, it's in charge of executive functioning. So it, it is in charge of rational thinking and understanding, you know, how to set boundaries and, you know, what is, how, how to not repeat mistakes again, right? And how to be rational in, in the steps that we make and making that right decision. And so when we're still trying to figure things out in that, Part of the brain is not fully developed yet we're going to make mistakes we're going to go with our emotions sometimes and sometimes the emotions are going to lead us down a path that might not be as as healthy for us and you know you bring up the point of the prefrontal cortex not being you know fully active and engaged and you think about some of the stuff you did <laughs> in your early 20s we didn't you know, always make the best decisions we're not going to talk about that either. and <laughs> and and that's when a lot of people um are sexual for the first time, possibly having a baby, uh, possibly getting married and not really knowing how to really judge that. And it's interesting to see people who do that in their early twenties versus in their thirties and they're in their thirties. They're having a whole different struggle with, okay, we went to college. We dated for X amount of time. We got engaged. We got married. We bought a house. We are now financially secure let's have a baby. And guess what? All the craziness that you did in your twenties that made you easily to get pregnant isn't happening in your thirties. Mm, right. Yeah. And so nature has a way of doing some of this for us when we're younger. And then if, if we get into our thirties, we're thinking too much and we are worried too much. And so, you know, you see so many young moms who, you know, they're watching everything they eat and they, they feel they're so hard on themselves and it's taking so much time remember my mom's podcast, she got married at 19 and they thought they were having a problem because she wasn't pregnant within the first three months of her marriage. You know, she went on to have seven kids before she turned 30. So obviously there wasn't a problem, but you know, the other thing that plays a part in it with our, um, our chemistry is birth control pills. And I heard this interesting study about when a woman is pregnant, she is she is, feels good around people who smell like her, which would be people who are her kin. Because when you're pregnant, you wanna be around family, you wanna feel safe. But when women are dating, they're supposed to be attracted to a smell that's different than them. Someone with different genetics, somebody with, with different history. And so what they found is that women who are on the pill, sometimes coupled with someone who is genetically similar, then they go off the pill to have a baby and they, they don't like the smell of their partner. So that's another interesting thing that like, I never knew about that, that mm -hmm. that's happening on such a subconscious level. And so when we talk about dangerous things that we do in our early twenties, well, we're supposed to be attracted to someone who's different than us and we're doing risky behavior and nature is like, I think that's a good plan. So it's not such a good plan for us as emotional beings, mm -hmm. but it does facilitate like, you know, I think still 50% of pregnancies are unplanned. It's still playing a big role in, you know, populating the planet. That even sounds low to me, just 50%. Yeah. I don't know. Like, but that's <laughs> without me looking in any book or reading any credible article, but that I would think it would be higher. Yeah. And I think that statistic was probably from 20 years ago. So you might be right. You know, another thing that complicates things once you, you know, get married to a committed partner um, are past traumas, mm -hmm. right? People who have gone through sexual traumas early on, 
you know, and in which that number is really high, which is it's unfortunately it's yeah. very high. Um, and yeah. you'd be amazed at how many stories we hear, but uh, you know, when they go through the sexual traumas early on, and then they are trying to engage in a sexual, a healthy sexual relationship with a committed partner, all of that trauma is bound to come up. Mm -hmm. And so if a couple is not taught how to handle that trauma, how to heal it, right? And, and when we say healing, the healing can only happen within the relationship. Like you can meet with a therapist you know, for years on end. And you could do a lot of work around the trauma, but when it comes to really healing it, the only person that can do that is your committed partner. So there's, there's something really complex going on here. And this is what we address in the weekend that we can't really address to just talking to people, but we need that infused time is, you know, when, when you get wounded sexually early in life, you're only developed to a certain degree uh, in your thinking and in your, and your physicality, but not so much in your emotions, but th those wounds, they stay dormant as cellular memory. And then that cellular memory, when you start using that part of your body to actually love another person, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it activates that cellular memory. And you have this dichotomy in you of, of, of being hurt and loving, right. and, and it's, it's really confusing. It's very, very confusing. And so, you know, I use this phrase with a, a client of mine is that you have to go through a deprogramming, mm -hmm. a deprogramming of everything that you have experienced and been through and everything that you have been taught and everything that you've been exposed to in order to program this deep connection, this deep loving connection, not just through your emotion and love, but also through physical sexuality. Mm -hmm. and, and so that is, you can imagine how complex that kind of work is, right, in a couple. And, you know, they, there is, there's no surprise that the average age of couples who have and report having the most satisfying sex is age 55. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, you know, the way that women naturally love is to be very generous and men are really wanting to receive. They've been given a lot by their mamas and they don't really understand because of the way our culture has been, there's not a really good pathway to becoming a real man in this world of what you're supposed to do to take care of your woman. So it feels really nice in the beginning. She's doing a lot of giving. He's doing a lot of receiving. It feels lovely. We're good. And then a baby happens. And that, that brings up all sorts of difficult things for women because their, you know, cute young bodies turn into <laughs> uh, misshaped, beautiful uh, pregnancy. <laughs> beautiful. Uh, yes. You know, yes. baby. Yes. Carriers. Absolutely but it doesn't help you feel very sexual. And it's not supposed to. And, you know, and then you have to go into all of the hormonal changes and learning how to become a parent and learning how to, uh, you know, your body's never the same after you have a baby. So you have to learn your body all over again at the same time as you are feeding a baby and trying to incorporate this other being who's extremely needy into your coupleness. Mm -hmm. And so uh, sometimes a lot of men who don't have as much of that chemistry because they weren't pregnant, they have to figure out how to, how to bond with the baby and how to be a giver. And then they have to grieve the loss of all that attention they were giving from getting from their partner. Right. That's soul attention, mm -hmm. right? Because now they have to split their energy yep. to taking care of their kids, taking care of their wife, taking care of the household, right? Just being a provider versus just receiving, right? right, And so there is, and especially with the, you know, with the first child, there is this grieving process that couples go through. Mm -hmm. And, you know, naturally their, their sexual health changes or their, their sexual interaction mm -hmm. changes because it has to. Um, but, you know, people who have this shame that they are different now and that they have to go back to the way things were, they get stuck in this, this really negative pattern. And it really gets stuck in this, this focus about physicality and not really about evolution. 
And the goal of, of all of us as individuals is to constantly evolve. The goal of every relationship is to evolve as well. And so our bodies evolve and so does our sexual interaction with our partner. And it evolves into, if we allow it, if we, if we learn what we're supposed to learn, it evolves into something that is so magical and so ideal that it has nothing to do with just the, the physical looks of, of your partner, mm -hmm. and which that's how it usually starts, right? We have sexual attraction with our partner. But if it was just about the way we looked, then couples would never make it past 10 years or 20 years, you know, as they start to get older, because our bodies get older. That's just, you know, part of life. So, so the first bridge we have to cross is from having a physical connection to having an emotional connection and the emotional connection, if we're doing it well, and you know, women, you've heard me say this, you got to learn how to drop the hanky, right? You can't do it all. You, you know, you, you can, of course you can, you're wonderful, but you know, you want to go and make all the money and you want to come home and take care of the kids because you know the right way and he doesn't. And you want to say everything that's the right way. And there's no place for him to come and, and save you or rescue you or join and with you take on his role you and right. take on his role. And for you to go, I think I'm going to go take a bath. <laughs> it's okay. You got this. You can take care of this child and I can go take some time and take some self-care for me. And, you know, then the worry is like, I've got to do everything. And then the guy's like, I don't know what to do. I'm not doing anything. I don't feel useful. I don't right. feel a part of this. And if, if he's not, especially early on in the, in the birth of a child, holding that baby and bonding with that baby and allowing that baby to, to have an emotional attachment to him, that bridge gets much more difficult for the couple to get to. And of course, resources absolutely get competed for at that stage because your relationship is going to get a lot less time and energy because you have to maintain your income mm -hmm. and now you have to give to a child. So that, that's the first really tricky part. And then a lot of couples get into that groove. Like they get there and they have what we would call service sex. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you've heard us use the analogy before of the iceberg, right? Now 15% of the iceberg is above the water, 85% under the water. And so we can apply this to how couples interact. And at this stage that Gene is talking about here, their, their relationship is really interacting at that 15% above the water, right? Their, their sex life is just about servicing each other, mm -hmm. right? Just servicing maybe a need, right? This primal need that they might have or stress, relief. stress relief, right? And everything else, all their other resources and energy is being dedicated towards the home, the bills, the job, you know, the the kids and, and everything else that it serves as a distraction in their life. And so unfortunately, what happens is that when that gets to be too much, when it's just not satisfying enough, this 15% this above the water, that's where their sex life is at. It's just service sex. Now they start looking at, well, how can we change this, right? And for men, what they do is they start looking at, well, maybe my testosterone has dropped. Maybe I need more, may, some testosterone treatments. Okay. Or, you know, there's commercials on, on TV for little blue pills and things like that, you know, where men are starting to have ED issues because it's not just about this physical connection anymore. There's a need for the couple that is not being provided on either side. And it's that emotional connection. It's being just drained dry. And your body has an incredible wisdom. And I hear this from women all the time. And I think ED is the same for men is women, their bodies go, I, I just can't do it anymore. I've got nothing left to give. I haven't even gone to the bathroom without someone else being in the room with me in years. Like <laughs> there's just, someone's always climbing on her. Someone always wants something from her. And she gets to a point where she's just like, I don't care about my sexuality. I don't want intimacy. I want to take a nap. <laughs> I would rather go eat some ice cream and take a nap and, you know, watch some TV than, than anyone wants something from me. 
And, and I think that's our body's way of saying, you can't continue to act like you did in your twenties. Right. You have to find something else that is going to replace that. And what we know about our sexuality is if there is not an emotional connection, then it has to get weirder and weirder physically. Yes, right. Because there is a desensitization that occurs mm -hmm. in the brain where- And the body. And the body, you know, well, you know, brain is gonna tell the body what to do, but you know, in, in the brain, what's happening is that I am not happy. I am not satisfied. This, this, is not, this is not what I want, right? And so because this is not what I want, I need to do something that is a little bit more stimulating, something that's a little bit more shocking in order to get that feeling, mm -hmm. right? In, in the extreme, you have people who, who hurt themselves, right? When you think about extreme, people who don't feel anything in their body, they don't feel you know, depression, they don't feel fear, they don't feel anything. And so they actually self-injure, mm -hmm. right? So on, on a smaller scale, we're talking about here in the relationship, when it comes to sex, if you're not feeling anything, then couples start to try to figure something out, something else out in order to feel again, right? Unfortunately, they're not connecting at that level that's actually going to unlock, you know, that, that treasure trove of, of real connection and real feeling. They're using the 15% the above the water. I, I remember having a, like a, just a little fantasy in my head about, I was just kind of so deadened inside. You know, I think we, it was probably during your doctor, we were so busy, we were so disconnected. Mm. And I just remember I had this little fa fantasy, like, what if we got divorced? Because that would be so painful. I'd feel something. And then we could fall in love again. Like I had no intention of not wanting to be with you, but it was like, let's go through some big trauma to like force ourselves back to right. like seeing each other and working on this. And, and, and I remember like that, I think that nothingness feeling feels much worse even than pain. Yeah. And that's why people like, they want to feel something. So they'll create a painful experience. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, if, if that turns into an affair, oh, the pain, mm. the pain of that for so very long. And, you know, you might feel, of course, an absolute ton of pain if, you, if you're the one who, were who was betrayed. But the person who does the betraying carries the brunt of that forever. That 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 becomes what their children see in them, mm -hmm. what their partner can never look them in the eye again without seeing that. Mm -hmm. It's so painful. So if you do anything like end the relationship before you create that type of feeling wound in that relation, it's a painful one. That's a really painful one. But Although I couples can get through it. Yeah. What I can add to that is in my own experience, seeing some clients because of the, the age range I tend to see, they are children, adult children of, um, you know, parents who one of them did cheat. And it can, of course, like in any relationship, in any family, it can be so complicated where that secret is held and one child holds it and the parent doesn't know and all of this, right? So um, I just know the pain from that perspective, from grown children mm -hmm. who have went through having parents who one of them had an affair because that will change their relationships and what they expect right. from people in the world. And it, it really shakes the foundation of your world. He healing sexual trauma and just mm -hmm. healing the normal progression of, of sexual development in a relationship is hard enough as it is. And when there is a, uh, a boundary violation or a trust violation like that in the relationship, it, it just adds so much more you know, healing that needs to happen. And again, uh, you know, couples, they have to get the right guidance in order to do this correctly, because it can cause not only just pain because of the situation, but it can cause ongoing pain, yep. you know, over and over and over again, over time. And, you know, there have been some really strong, resilient couples that when they do make it, across that bridge to that emotional connection, 
through the pathway of an affair, they will tell you that they're better than they were before the affair. Absolutely. Yeah. I, we're not saying that couples can't recover, you know, from a trust violation like that, but it, it takes a lot of work and it's painful and it's painful. And they have to just expect that if they are going to move forward in the healing process, it, it is going to get a little bit worse before it gets better, you know, but if they are able to push through and they're able to learn what they're supposed to learn, being out on the other side, there is so much more of a connection than they ever felt before ever in their relationship. And so if we go to the third stage, you know, so the, the couple's weekend is designed to really understand that, uh, that emotional bridge stage, which is why it's from people between the ages of like thirties to, you know, late fifties um, of really, how do you do that? How do you create that emotional connection and peace when you never learned it or how to do that? Yeah. So that's what we teach it in, uh, on the weekend. And what happens in the third stage actually is a spiritual connection. And when you come to the place of the spiritual connection, which, you know, I think we've been developing in that space for the last few years, mm -hmm. the physical thing is everything you ever learned about sexuality physically seems ridiculous. Like it would really matter, like what someone looks like or how often you're having sex or just how all the things that you thought were so important when you were younger, it just becomes like silly because there's something else that happens that is so much more profound and so much more magical and secure and safe and depth that you can't experience when you're just in that physical place. In that physical place, you're just very insecure. Well, I mean, that, that's where you're, you're seeing TV programs where they're like all lovey-dovey and you're just, you roll your eyes and you gag because you know that it's just not true. <laughs> it's, it's just completely false, right? Yeah. And how they're portraying love, especially later on in life, mm -hmm. it is so much more, there's so much more depth to it that, you know, these two actors can't really portray it. No, because they're actors. <laughs> <laughs> they're actors, right. You know, so, you know, pay attention to the podcast when we interview Freddie and Elspeth. Freddie and Elspeth are uh, tantra sex therapists. I don't know what the right word is. They, they, guides. they, yeah, say guides, mentors, yeah. guides. Yeah. They, they work in that realm of help, helping people with their sexuality. And, you know, one of the things that they said is when you get to this stage of life, you know, which is probably um, late thirties till, you know, your middle fifties, the graph of, of a man's sexuality looks like this, <laughs> like turned on release done. Right. And for women, it looks like this. And so by the time he's done, she hasn't even started getting turned on yet. And so I hear women say all sorts of things like you got to preheat the oven or you got to, uh, yeah. All those things. All <laughs> things that they're trying to explain that before they even have gotten all the thoughts out of their head about, you know, who's got to go to the dentist and what's happening for dinner and all that, like, oh, I'm a sexual person. And, right. and so th there's a lot of missing and, and it's like meeting over, over here where she comes up, he's, he goes up and over, she comes up slow like that. Well, in, in the thing. later stages of a relationship, mm -hmm. you know, as couples do the work and progress, they learn that sexuality isn't just about the physical act. You know, it is about so much more than that. And it, it can start days before where there is more connection and there's affection and there's, you know, eye gazing and, and just the bonding that is occurring in your words and your actions before you even engage in any type of sexual activity. And, and that is mind blowing to, to a lot of people when they start to understand mm -hmm. it. It's like, oh, wow, I, I didn't really see that. I, I thought it's like, we got 10 minutes because the kids are asleep kind of thing. <laughs> and no, that it just, it doesn't work that way, mm -hmm. right? And it, it, it's not supposed to, it never was supposed to. And our society has made it so that sex has to fit into a box and it has to fit into a window and it has to be scheduled. And that's just not what life is about. 
You can't schedule life and you can't put life in a box. And that's what we really experience with mm -hmm. a committed partnership is the ability to really experience life in the moment and at a spiritual level. And so I would even say like the ED issues, it might be your body's way of letting you know you want more, that you don't just want sure. to be, you know, for sure. The Eight, slam bam thing. You also want nurture. Ninety percent. I, I believe it's even higher, but ninety percent of ED issues in men is psychologically driven. Because mm -hmm. you want love too in connection and and to be nurtured and taken care of, and you know we all want that. But isn't that crazy that I? It's not like there's many ads out there saying work on your mental health and in your emotional no. needs. It's all about take this pill, try this out. Yes. Like what? <laughs> and then that adds a lot more shame and a lot more pressure. Right. And because it, you, do, it doesn't drive connection. And, and it points out that something is wrong with you. And that if you take this cure, quote unquote, that things are going to get better. And, you know, unfortunately, all the things that are really bad for us, those are the things that are advertised, you know, heavily in our world, mm -hmm. you know, fast food. It's like, don't worry about cooking for your kids tonight. You're <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, sometimes this is good for you, <laughs> but you know, the, the thing is it, it's, it's always this quick fix. And, and that's what this world has pushed us to do is look for that quick fix because who's got the time, right? We, we don't have time. We, we got to rush from here to there and kids got soccer practice and baseball practice and basketball. And so we, we have to, fit things in, in the time that we have, because we're not making time for ourselves. We're not making time for our relationship. We're not making time for our family, really. And, and one of the, the poor hygiene that couples do is they spend way too much time in front of the TV. Yeah. And so they think it's relaxing, but it's actually filling more stuff in their head. They have to clear out in order to have sex. And so we just spent, you know, four nights at the inn, this beautiful inn that doesn't have any TVs. And we sat in front of a fire every night. Yeah. And, you know, when you're sitting in front of the fire, which is what human beings have been doing for thousands of years, you slow down and you talk and you laugh and you share and you bond and you even maybe get up and dance a little bit or you, dance. you know, maybe, maybe that happens or you uh, <laughs> cuddle, all the things that actually lead to great sex. Sure, right? sure. Yeah, you know, I, I was just thinking to myself, I bet that the majority of people who are watching this, they know the end of this phrase, moderate to severe. Do you know it, Angie? Well, I mean, I don't know if I'm right, but it says something about my brain. Moderate <laughs> to severe anxiety and depression. Oh, that's a good one. That's another one, too. That's another one. But if you're psoriasis. watching plaque psoriasis, plaque psoriasis right? Psoriasis. Oh, okay, I get it now. <laughs> right? Or mesothelioma. mesothelioma. And, they, and they show this wonderful relationship. Oh, right. And then in the words, it's like, if you're going to have a heart attack or your skin's going to fall off, or yeah. maybe you're going to lose your hearing or you could possibly die. But in the meantime, if you take this pill, you're going to have wonderful relationships. You, you think about that, <laughs> just how much we are being educated on these things that don't matter to the majority of us in our lives. And we know about it, but we don't really know about how to connect with my partner sitting next to me, watching mm -hmm. the commercial about moderate to severe plaque psor uh, psoriasis. Right. And, mm -hmm. and that's the, that's the scary thing about this world and, and about our media is that we need to work very hard to, to find the information that is really going to benefit us, mm -hmm. right? We, we have to dig through all of the fluff that, that we are being presented with on a daily basis to find you, the nugget of truth. You might even be watching this and have another one or two screens in front of you. Oh, I hope not. Mm. It's possible. I really hope not. <laughs> we see it three screens deep. You know, you got your phone, you got your laptop, you got your TV. It's like, well, I'm working, but I'm chatting with my friends and I'm watching my show. Yeah. That's how much bombardment we yeah, have. Right. Three screens deep. So 
And are we good for a meditation? We only have a few minutes. Absolutely. Left. Yes. I think that'd be great. That. Can you, can you figure out a way to all to ground us all after this kind of discussion? So. Absolutely. <laughs> we, we, today we went and meditated and we were listening to a guided meditation of someone else's work. I don't know his name. I'd love to quote him. I think his name is Kevin. Anyways, all I'm going to do is share a story that, that he's shared in the beginning of his meditation. So I just want you to listen. So, you know, just close your eyes. And he was sharing a story about a monastery in the 1950s that needed to move. And they needed to move the monastery because they were going to put a super highway in there. And there was this clay Buddha statue that was 10 feet tall. And it was one of their, you know, their sacred statues. And they were really concerned about moving this beautiful piece of artwork and something that, you know, is spiritually uh, ins inspirational to them. And so they did a lot of care and planning and they hired, you know, these cranes that, that were able to lift this. And the morning came to move the Buddha and the cranes come in and the people come in and they get all the straps and they begin to move the Buddha and they had accounted for the weight of this and the height of it. And it started to crack. And they put it back down because they were very concerned about ruining this ancient, beautiful statue. So they put a pause on the production and they decided they were going to get stronger, better equipment tomorrow. And then something really horrible happened. It had started to rain. So they covered the statue in all these tarps and the, the head guy, the head monk in the monastery, he was really worried about it in the middle of the night. And so he goes out with his flashlight and, and he, you know, sloshes his way through the muddy ground and he's getting soaked with the rain. And he looks under the tarp and he sees the cracks and he shines his flashlight and he sees something shiny and he's really confused. And so he digs a little bit at the, at the clay and he pulls a chunk off and he sees more shininess. And he starts working, he starts pulling away the clay. And what he finds hours later after he totally removes as much of the clay as possible and it's washed away by the rain is this is actually a beautiful Buddha made of solid gold. And that's who we are in our core. And what happens through life and what happened to this statue is they covered it in mud and clay in order to protect it, protect it from thieves and protect it from its true value of someone who would wish it, it harm. And who we are, especially in our sexuality and what we can show our partners is that beautiful, pure golden source that we are underneath all our wounds. And it takes the work of ourselves and our partner to remove all the clay that gets there through all the wounds in order to really reveal our true spiritual greatness and to create a union between the God and the goddess in the form of human beings and, sexu and the sexual experience here on earth. And when you decide that you're ready. You decide when it's time to open your eyes. But I want you just to know that who you are underneath all these wounds is a great spiritual being. And so is your partner. Even if all you see right now are their flaws and their imperfections. Thank you for joining us tonight. Until next time, synergize your life and synergize your love.